Hello, how are you? Thank you for joining me again. We are today looking at Genesis chapter 12. Very interesting journey we've been having and I pray that you are learning. If there's something you need clarity on, please just write it on the text or the chat or comments. Just talk to me. Let me know if you need clarity on any of the scriptures that we have covered so far. Um, from Genesis chapter 1 to 11, there's a lot, there's a lot. And what I know is that there's a lot more. I'm not, I'm not the final, the final thing. I don't have the final words, but there's a lot more. If you search more, uh, even from what we have said, and you search more, there is more that you can find. And, and just have the desire to learn and and read the Bible, learn the Bible, understand the Bible, and make the Bible your life. Genesis chapter twelve, we are talking about the call of Abram, Abram what we call Abraham. You know, we are so used to call him, to calling him Abraham that even when we see uh, the word Abraham, people are like, oh, what's that? Abraham. So I will try to maintain Abraham uh, as it is written at this time because by this time, he is not yet Abraham. And so we will see. We'll see how it works. If I say Abraham, just forgive me, but it is Abraham. Verse 1, now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. So remember, we had seen that this journey began with Terah, but we don't know, there's no evidence, biblical evidence anyway, that Terah had been ordered by God to go to Canaan. No, we don't see that. But what we do see is that Terah had a desire to actually go to Canaan. Maybe maybe it's because he needed more land or better land. We do not know. Okay? And, and so we are here today looking at Abram. Okay? And, and so the Bible says, and the Bible talks, uh, God talks to Abram and says, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And this is interesting because... When God talks to us, sometimes he gives us commands that we don't understand. When he talks to us, sometimes he tells us to do things that may not necessarily make sense to us. When he talks to us, sometimes he tells us to take a path that we do not know where it's going. We don't know the end of this path. And, and the funny thing is we are expected to obey because we believe that God can do it. We believe that God knows it. For example, if he says, wake up and go to this road and follow this path, I would do it because I believe he knows what's at the end. And I trust him that he will not take me to places that he does not desire for me. Okay. And so it's interesting to understand this concept that God just appears to Abram. And, and, and this is the thing, God is revealing himself to Abraham because as we see and, and as we will see going forward is that Terah or Nahor, the, the grandfather of Abraham, did not know God. And so there are generations, as we saw last time, there were generations, several generations before we come to the life or to the part of Abraham, before we come to the generation of Abraham, there were so many other generations that had gone by meaning that they may have lost the touch with God. They may have lost the fellowship with God. So God reveals himself and says, move away, move out from your father's house to the land that I will show you. Now, that's another statement that is not very clear. The Lord doesn't state which nation or which land from the onset. He doesn't say go to Nairobi. He doesn't say go to Cairo. No, he just says move away from this place to the place that I will show you. And, and these are the things that I keep asking people. And I keep asking also myself, can I trust God so much that I can go to places uh, he orders me to without him actually telling me where I'm going? You know, I remember, uh, you know, in the past days and, and, and past days meaning several years, maybe decades or centuries, where the missionaries would wake up and, and they would feel led to go to a certain country or to a certain place. 
and they will just wake up and prepare themselves and move and, and begin to go to this country without knowing anyone in that country or in that place or town, without having any networks or connections, and they will just go to these cities and they would arrive in these cities and they would start preaching and they had no contact. And I wonder to myself, is that even possible today? Is it still happening? I don't know. If you know of such people who wake up in the morning and they go to cities and they move away from their homes and they go to cities that God has shown them, please leave a comment. I want to know them. I want to hear from their stories because in today's world, it's very difficult for someone to actually wake up and just go and, and uh, you know, we need to have connections. For example, you don't, you don't just wake up and go to and come to Nairobi when you don't know anyone in Nairobi. You don't know the hotels. You don't know anyone. You, don't, you have no place to stay. If you come to Nairobi without knowing anyone, you may end up being mugged, being, you know, kidnapped, killed, whatever it is. You go to, to Cape Town or you go to Johannesburg without knowing someone. You know, today's world, we need to know people. We need to know someone that even if I'm going to this country, I go knowing I'm going to, to be picked by so-and-so at the airport and I'm going to stay at a certain place and I'm going to minister in certain churches or in certain villages and I'm going for a mission in one, two, three, four. So I have my itinerary very clear and then I come back to my country. Even if I go as a missionary and stay for like two, three years, I need a place where I can be hosted. But this time, God doesn't show you. And I wonder whether we still have that kind of faith where we can wake up and just go to the land that he will show us, to the place that he will show us. So you just wake up and start going without really knowing where you're going. And when someone asks you, so where are you, where are you going? And, the, and you say, the Lord will show me where I'm going. And you're already on the way. You look like a fool. In today's world, you know, and, and many of us will tell you so. Many of us will tell you, no, you don't look nice. You don't look, um, you don't look wise. You don't look like, uh, like you know what you're doing. You need to know the end from the beginning. Before you begin, you need to have a plan. Before you begin, you, know, you need to know the end before you begin. I will show you. Go to the land that I will show you. Then verse 2 says, I will make of you... <laughs> a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. Oh, wait, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. So wake up, go uh, to the land that I will show you. But then the Lord says several things and these are things that are enough to make anyone leave their family. These are promises that are uh, enough to make anyone walk out and go to wherever place you want them to go. I will make you a great nation. My good, every one of us wants to become a great nation. You know, I want my, my children to be, to be great and to have a great nation. I want my clan to be big and great. I want my descendants to thrive and I want them to sit upon the thrones of my country. We, want, we all want that. We all want our children uh, to go and study in nice schools so that they can meet powerful people. And in the process, our children can also become very powerful. We want that. We want that. We want to be uh, to be the, the ancestor who set the path for our generations. That when they look back, they say, thank you for that person. Thank you for our grandfather. He lived well. You know, we want, we want to see that. And so the Lord is telling, the, is telling Ab Abram, I'm, I will make you into a great nation, my friend. And this is a confession, sorry, this is a covenant or a promise that we want in our lives. We want God to make us into a great nation. We want God to be with us. We want him to open up the windows of heaven. We want him to bless our children that we can become anything that he desires for us. So I will make you into a great nation. Then number two, I will bless you. Who doesn't want to be blessed? I mean, like anyone, anyone wants to be blessed. We want God to bless us. We want, and these are the things, this is enough. When God comes, tells you, I want you to leave your people. And then he, go, he follows up that statement with these statements. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. Now, remember uh, when we talked about the Tower of Babel and the people wanted to make a name for themselves. And I talked about people, you know, even in my own country who want to have a name for themselves. And the Bible says, God tells Abraham, and I will make your name great. 
Now, it's one thing to, to be descended from a great name. It is another thing for you to be that great name. Okay? It is one thing to be Nelson Mandela's son or daughter. It is a different thing to be Nelson Mandela. And, and what God is saying to Abraham is that he's going to make his name great. It's not about the descendants. It's about him. And this is what we also want. I want my name to be great. You want your name to be great. You want to be known. But let me tell you the dangers of this is that that desire, if you want it from you, you see, this one is coming from God. Maybe Abraham didn't have the plans to make his name great. Maybe he was just chilled and relaxed. Maybe he was okay as he was. But then God initiates this. And if God initiates it, that's okay. The problem is when we initiate it, when we try to make our names great, when we try to do things that can give us more leverage, more power. This is where many people end up in witchcraft. Many people end up, uh, many pastors end up in doing all these crazy things that they are doing today to fill up the members of their churches or to have influence and to have control. This is where many believers are walking into witches' houses and, and witch doctors and wizards and they're treated and then they come back to businesses and they want to mix up business with God and they're saying God has blessed me. Yet in truth, it is not a blessing of God. It is a power or a, a dark power just to make their name great. And then number three, you will be a blessing. So I'll make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great. And you will be a blessing. And this is where we draw the line. We don't want to become a blessing. We want to be blessed, but we don't want to become a blessing. We want to receive, but we don't want to give. We want to be prayed for. We don't want to pray for others. We want to be visited. We don't want to visit, okay? We don't want to be a blessing to others. But God is saying all these things to Abraham. So when you follow that statement, uh, you know, in continuation in verse 3, now this is, the, this is like now the crown. Of, of this whole uh, statement, verse 3. It's like the crown of, of this. You know, I'm going to make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will, I will, I will make your name great and, and you will be a blessing. Then the Lord now crowns it and says, I will bless those who bless you and the ones who curse you, I will curse you. My friend, I will bless those who bless you and I will curse those who curse you. You see, uh, being a great name is one thing. Being blessed is another thing. Having a great name is another thing. Becoming a blessing is a different thing. But then, but then, now, this thing goes even to other people. It's not just you. It's not other people. If they bless you, I will bless you, says the Lord. If they curse you, I will curse you. And then, and then, it now even goes beyond that. And the Bible says, and God says, and in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. All the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now, if someone came and told you, leave your family for this, you would leave them. I guarantee you. Someone you know has the power to actually do these things. And the only thing that he's asking you to do is leave. Leave your home, leave your culture leave your people go to the land i will show you and then i'm gonna do this and then he crowns it i'll make you into a great nation i'll bless you i will make your name great you will be a blessing i will bless those who bless you i'll cast those who cast you and through you all the families of the world will be blessed my friend you will leave your family you will leave your home you will leave your kindred you will leave everything for such a blessing and how I pray that these blessings can become, can come alive in our lives. That the Lord can make us great. That the Lord can bless us. That the Lord can make our names great. That the Lord can be with us and he can, that we can be a blessing. That the Lord can bless those who bless us and cast those who cast us. And that through us, families can be blessed. Many times we ask for this prayer. We ask for even when we pray, we ask, oh Lord, bless me. This is, we, we, we claim it. We claim this blessing. But then we are not willing to leave. Abraham was willing to leave everything he knew. And, and this blessing cannot operate if you're not willing to leave the things that you ought to leave. To leave the things that you must leave. 
verse 4. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Now remember, Terah is dead. Okay, so, uh, and, and he is a, a young man called Lot, who is Abraham's nephew, who is now like a son, like his brother. Okay, because they were basically almost raised in the same way because Haran, the father of Lot, died when Lot was still a baby. And so Terah had to bring up Lot. And so Abraham and Lot, they are almost like brothers. But Abraham is Lot's uncle. So he was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. And verse 5, Abraham took his wife Sarai and his brother's son Lot and all the possessions that they had gathered and the persons whom they had acquired in Haran. And they set forth to go to the land of Canaan. When they had come to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place at Shechem, to, for, to the oak of Mori. At the time, the, the Canaanites were in the land. All right, so now we come to the point where we have people filling the earth. People have filled the earth. Now we have the Canaanites, okay? They're everywhere. Terah begins his journey, and then Abram comes, and and Terah dies along the way where he settled in Haran. And then Abram decides, okay, let's now go. Let's keep going. The Lord comes and speaks to him. And Abram takes everyone. Abram takes his wife, takes his son, uh, his, his brother's son or his nephew. Takes all the people, takes all the possessions and begins a journey to the land where the Lord will show him. And he finds himself in Canaan. So he passed through the land of the uh, to the place at Shechem. You will see Shechem as we go on in the story of Joseph uh, and his brothers, uh, Jacob. And uh, when Jacob sends his sons, they were at Shechem, and they were there, you know, to do to take care of their sheep. So Shechem to the oak of Mori. At the time, the Canaanites were in the land. Verse seven. Then the Lord appeared to Abram. And said, so this is another time. So this is the second time that the Lord is appearing again. We don't know how he appeared. So it's not described. We are not told this is how the Lord appeared. So he, has, uh, he appeared again and said to your offspring, I will give this land. Okay, so basically this is what's happening. Abraham, when he's living, he's not going to Canaan. He doesn't know where he's going. He just keeps walking and going and going. And then when he gets to Canaan, the Lord appears to him and says, okay, this is the land I was telling you about. So to your offspring, I will give you this land. So sometimes we do not know where we are going, especially if you're walking in the spirit, especially if you're walking with God. You don't know where you're going, but you do know that you are going somewhere and you do know that God has ordered you to go somewhere and God has asked you to go somewhere, but you don't know where. And sometimes we only know where we were going when we arrive and we are there and we're like, oh, this is the place, you know. Contrary to popular opinion that if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there because you have no plan, you have no vision, there's no you're going. And these people in the Bible did not have any plans, did not have uh, they didn't have everything together, okay? And, and this is what I try to bring out, that you don't have to have everything together. You don't have to have your plan. You don't have to know where you're going as long as you're in Christ, as long as you're in God, and God has ordered you to go, just go. To your offspring, I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. Then verse 8, from there he moved on to the hill country on the east of Bethel, uh, Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and invoked the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on by stages towards the Negev. Now, he is, he is told, this land is yours. To your offspring, I'm going to give you this land. And so he keeps moving to explore this land and he keeps moving to the hill country on the east of Bethel. He pitched his tent on Bethel on the east and Ai on the west, on the east, sorry, 
Bethel on the west and Ai on the east, who is in between Bethel and Ai. And there he built an altar to the Lord and invoked the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on by stages toward the Negev. Now, one of the characteristics that we will keep seeing here about Abram is that he was building altars everywhere. Wherever he went, he built an altar and invoked the name of the Lord. Why? Because this was customary. This was their way of life. This is their way of doing things. They built an altar. Now, there is people who will tell you that you have to build altars wherever you go. But I want to say you don't have to build altars wherever you go because the age of altars is gone. Like we do, we are not longer in the age of altars. Abraham was Abraham was doing this because it was their their way of life, but it was also required in their culture. And we will see this is was before the law, and we will see it when the the Lord gives the law in the book of Leviticus. He gives the law and. Now altars become part of the sacrifice, the sacrificial system. But then we look at Jesus Christ in the book, um, when we come now to the New Testament, and out of that, out, up to that time, we have seen altars. But then when Jesus comes to the earth, he doesn't build altars. And so when, when a pastor or a preacher or a bishop goes to every city, and every city they are raising altars, I wonder what, where they read it, because Jesus doesn't raise altars in every city that he goes to. He doesn't raise an altar in Capernaum. He doesn't raise altar in Bethlehem. He doesn't raise altars in Nazareth. The Apostle Paul doesn't raise altars in every city that he goes. He doesn't raise an altar in Corinth. He doesn't raise an altar in Ephesus or in Philippi. No, he doesn't do that. He just goes in and starts preaching. Why? Because when Jesus died at the cross, he fulfilled the altar requirement. He died at the cross. He became the sacrificial lamb. He became the ultimate sacrifice, and Calvary, where he was, uh, where he was hung or crucified, became the final altar, the final altar place. So we are no longer required to keep going raising altars because I've seen that doctrine and that teaching now getting into many people's lives, where people are saying there are altars speaking against me, there are altars speaking against my life, there are altars speaking against my lineage. And so the solution to many of them, which is not true or false, which is false, is that your pastor or your bishop tells you, okay, go, let us raise an altar that will speak against these other altars, okay? And, and the truth of the matter is the altar of Jesus Christ at the cross speaks against this altar. So all you have to do is to invoke that altar of the cross against these other altars. And if you want to find a study on that in the Bible, you can look at the book of Samuel and read the whole of it. And especially the first few uh, chapters where Elkanah, the, uh, Eli the priest, not Elkanah, Eli the priest is warned. And then the Ark of the Covenant is taken and it goes to the land of the Philistines. And the Ark of the Covenant, the Philistines put the Ark of the Covenant among their gods. And in the next morning, they find their main god, Dagon, bending or bowing before the Ark of the Covenant because the altar of Jesus Christ at the cross is more powerful than any other altar that has ever been created. Now there was famine in the land, so Abram went down to Egypt to reside there as an alien or a foreigner, for the famine was severe in the land. So where Abram has gone and he has been promised to your offspring, I will give this land, now there is famine. You know, this this shows us that it doesn't if whatever God promises you doesn't mean that it will come easy. There's gonna be some challenges, and some of these challenges we have to actually fight them. So Abraham decides, okay, because there's the, the famine is severe, uh, let me leave this land, let me go to Egypt. So we will see this again in the future where Abraham's uh, grandchildren, great grandchildren, will also travel to Egypt because of famine, meaning this area was quite prone to famines. Okay. Now, when he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife Sarai, I know well that you are a woman beautiful in appearance. And when the Egyptians see you, they will say, This is his wife. Then they will kill me, but they will let you leave. So, Versions, different versions of the Bible say you are that Sarai was 
a very, very beautiful woman. Very beautiful. Okay? When he was about to enter Egypt, he says, I know well that you are a woman beautiful in appearance. Sarai was a beautiful woman. Very beautiful. It's a kind of beauty that turns heads. Not, not the kind of beauty that, oh, yeah, she's beautiful. No, the kind of beauty that, oh, she's beautiful. Oh, they turn heads. Okay? And Abram was afraid of having a beautiful woman. <laughs> and, and so the, he says, say that you are my sister so that it may go well with me because of you and that my life may be spared on your account. So they agree. All right, say that you are my sister. Okay, now, if it was today's women or mo most of them, especially Kenyan women, they would have caused a lot of drama. Who are you hiding? Why am I your sister? What do you mean? I'm not your sister. I am your wife. And you better declare me. You better uh, 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 announce me that I'm your wife. Announce from the rooftops. You know, it would have been drama. But again, nothing against Kenyan women. You know, nothing against any woman. Say you are my sister so that it may go well with me because of you and that my life will be spared, may be spared on your account. So Abraham is worried about his life. He's worried about himself. This is the guy who has a covenant with God, but he's worried about himself. He's worried that he's going to die, that they would kill him. Ha. So when the officials of Pharaoh saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh. My goodness. <laughs> and the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. Now, this is an interesting concept. And I tell you, she was beautiful. That when they saw her, they went to Pharaoh direct and said, there is a beautiful woman, oh great Pharaoh. You should make her your wife. And the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. And for her sake... He dealt well with Abram, and he had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male and female slaves, female donkeys, and camels. So suddenly, Abram becomes rich because now Pharaoh thinks he's paying dowry or he's paying something. He's just treating Abram very nice because now he thinks, oh, I've, this, is, this guy is going to become my brother-in-law, so I better be nice to him. <laughs> But the Lord afflicted Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's, Abram's wife. So Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she's my sister so that I took her for my wife? Now then he is your wife. Take her and be gone. And Pharaoh gave his men orders concerning him, and they sent him on the way with his wife and all that he had. So this is what happens, of what I think happened. Pharaoh is a powerful figure. Pharaoh is a powerful man. In Egypt, um, he's almost, uh, he's, like, he's a god. Not almost, he's a god. He was a god at that time. So this guy is a god. And, and the officials have brought this beautiful woman. And he believes that this beautiful woman is, is unmarried, okay? And, and so usually what used to happen was that Pharaoh, a man of the status of Pharaoh, would sleep with this woman the first night that she comes to this uh, house or to this palace. But for some reason, Pharaoh did not do that. I think the Lord, I think the Lord prevented that from happening. But then Pharaoh... And his house are afflicted with a lot of uh, plagues and, and, and sicknesses and all these things. And, and they don't know why. So they, they are, are, are spiritual people. In other words, spiritual meaning they are looking to the other side. They have dark magic. As we will also see in the future when the Lord is delivering the children of Israel. And so they have this, this magic that they try. They, they, so through that magic, they may have detected the problem here is Sarai. And so, or someone maybe said, this, this guy, or Abram said, or Sarai said, we do not know. But then, so Pharaoh called Abram and says, what is this you have done to me? Why, why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she's my sister so that I took her? Now then he's your wife. So Pharaoh realizes that all the damage, all the plagues, all the sicknesses that are coming are because of Sarah. A Sarai, and it's because he took someone's wife. And instead of killing them, 
he decides, you know what, I'm not, I don't want any part of this. So he is your wife, take him and, and, and leave. And he gives orders concerning Abram and, and, you know, go. And the Bible says with his wife and all that he had, meaning the camels, the oxen, and everything that he got from Pharaoh, he left. And so he's a rich guy now. And you see, when God walks with you, when God is with you, he defends you. He protects you from some of these things. And Abram could or would have believed that God would save him. But for some reason, he didn't believe it. And so these are the things that we need to learn. That God is with you all along. He will protect you. He will shield you. He will protect your children. He will protect your wives, your husbands. He will protect everything that you have, your property. As long as you obey him. You see, because this was an act of obedience. Abraham, leave your people. And so he leaves his people. He goes to the land. There's famine in the land. He goes to Egypt. In Egypt, he lies. And God still saves him. And, and so what we have to understand is that when it comes to obedience, and we will see this obedience of Abram, even in the coming chapters, he was ruthlessly obedient. Thank you, and God bless you. Music